right? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so, as you heard, my name is Marco, and this is my colleague, Enes. Uh, and today we will talk a little bit about uh, challenges and pitfalls of uh, modern computer vision models. Uh, so, we are coming from data science team from Styria Group. <clears throat> if you haven't heard about Styria, um, it's uh, the biggest regional and biggest Croatian media company. Uh, so if you are from the region, then you probably heard of uh, 24 Sata, Večernji List, uh, Njuškalo, Poslovni Dnevnik, and these are all Styria brands. Uh, so today we will talk about, uh, for start, just briefly about the evolution of computer vision models, uh, how uh, these uh, models evolved from handcrafted features uh, to powerful deep learning models. This is important to understand uh, the problems that uh, my colleague will uh, demonstrate later. Uh, just briefly about high dependency on the training set distribution of these models, uh, with some practical examples of uh, specific classifiers, uh, and then we will uh, speak a little bit about uh, self-driving cars uh, uh, as an attractive use case uh, in this field. Uh, and after that, my colleague Enes will uh, demonstrate some adversarial attacks on deep learning models. We even made some small demo, uh, demo project just for this lecture. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, he will also uh, present uh, some uh, strategies for defending against uh, this kind of attacks. So for start, uh, regarding the evolution of computer vision uh, uh, models in general, we had uh, big breakthroughs and I would even say revolution uh, back uh, five uh, years ago, uh, somewhere around 2011-2012, uh, uh, with the emergence of um, new technologies, uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, and the reason for this is twofold. The first is that uh, we got uh, our hands on the big amounts of data, so big data sets, most notably image net data set that is used for the most uh, scientific research, uh, and also the involvement of the, of the hardware. So uh, before that, we had handcrafted feature, features like the ones on the image. So uh, here we can see some edge detectors and some uh, sift features. Uh, de detected on the object, but as you can see, if we slightly move the object around, uh, we lose some features and get some other ones uh, recognized, and these features are really unstable, and uh, shallow machine learning models placed on top of this uh, just didn't work quite well. Uh, so with the emergence of uh, powerful hardware and the lots of data, uh, we uh, got resurrection of uh, neural network models, most notably CNNs, uh, which are trying to mimic the way how uh, uh, the visual cortex of mammals work. So uh, these networks have uh, two dimensional layers, uh, which we call convolutional filters, placed uh, in, this, in a series of layers. And uh, with each uh, layer, the network uses more and more abstract features. Uh, so for the image on the input, uh, first layers detect primitive and less complex features and the next layers uh, uh, detect more and more complicated and abstract features. And in the end, at the end, we have this uh, standard traditional multilayer perceptron uh, neural network. And, and at the exit of the network, we have probabilities for classes uh, presented in the training data set. So these networks are really powerful. Uh, they, we say that they are really descriptive. They can uh, really well fit the data, but at the same time, this is the, their uh, drawback because they t uh, tend to overfit the data, describe it too well. Uh, and uh, for specific use cases, we need to have specific models trained on specific data. Uh, and this is the reason why just plugging in some third party API uh, won't work for your specific use case. Uh, and the next reason why this would be a bad idea is because we do not have this API under our control. Uh, so we do not, do not know which data set was used for training and what distribution of this data set is. And even more important, we do not know how this model works. We even do not know sometimes this with our own models. Uh, so this is one example of, um, of a model that uh, we trained on our own data. Uh, and when presented these images, uh, as you can see, both images show a BMW car. And when we ask our model, what is this on the image, for the left image, it says BMW car. But for the right image, it says PlayStation video game. 
Why is it so and is it good for us? Well, uh, we trained this on our own data set where we also had uh, uh, some uh, PlayStation or computer video games as, an, as objects in the database. And uh, this uh, image on the right is not the real photo of a car. It's a render or a drawing. And it reminds the model uh, probably uh, on the Need for Speed or some similar color from the video game. And this is the exactly behavior that we want. But if we plug in some third party API, Probably for both of these images, we will get result that it's a BMW car, and this is not something that we want to achieve, of course. So, uh, uh, these uh, problems uh, are present in various different use cases, like security and surveillance systems, fraud detection, drones, uh, self-driving vehicles, and so on. Uh, so, we will now focus a little bit on self-driving uh, vehicles, because they are so attractive now. Um, as you can see here on the image, we have some interesting, uh, interesting result. Uh, getting back a few months ago, Elon Musk said that probably we will not need LiDAR systems on self-driving cars, that we can uh, rely completely on computer vision and cameras. And why he said so? Because he realized that how, how powerful these models, models are and the fact that humans also drive the vehicles relying only on the cars, okay, we, only on the eyes. Okay, we have two eyes and uh, we, can, we have stereo vision, so we have also some depth, uh, but not just the depth that is important, but also the context and the realiz realization and, and prior knowledge that we have about the world, world around us. So here, for example, you can see a uh, person and a bicycle imprinted actually on the back of the car, and the model thinks that it's bicycle or person in front of it. So it's not the behavior that we want. And uh, this is just one example of potential problems. There are many other problems. Uh, and for some of them, uh, my colleague Ennis uh, will now show you a few more examples. Uh, hello. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you uh, how to uh, train a neural network that can uh, drive a car. Uh, so, uh, what what you need for uh, for training any network, you need some training data, and in this case, uh, what you need is uh, some video footage of uh, a car driving, and for each of the frames of this video, uh, you need uh, information about uh, velocity, uh, gas, brake. Uh, and uh, what you would do, you would create um, an architect uh, convolutional neural network architecture, which takes as an input uh, image or a couple of uh, images from the, the video, and as, uh, as an output, it uh, returns uh, velocity, uh, steering angle, uh, brake, gas, and also, we can have an, as an output, uh, uh, we want to, to recognize the objects, for example, traffic signs, pedestrians, and so on. So you can do this in one convolutional uh, network. Uh, opti optimization objective for this uh, model uh, would be, uh, you, you try to, to predict the values for steering angle and so on uh, that are Close as as close as possible to to your training data from uh, so real driving footage or some data that was created in a self uh, driving car uh, simulator, for example, for simulating uh, dangerous situations uh, to enrich your data set. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for object uh, recognition, for example, traffic signs, uh, what you need is. Uh, uh, which you need is to classify. Uh, you need to classify. You need to classify them as uh, uh, as accurate as possible. And here we use uh, uh, usually a cross entropy loss function. The details are not that important. Uh, so uh, here are some results. For example, this is a publicly available data set, and it is. Uh, uh, of German tra traffic signs, and as you can see, these uh, these signs are not really uh, clear images. Yet, 
the classification accuracy is above 99%. And I, I have personally trained the, the model to do this, and it uh, works really well. Uh, also, uh, you, you can, uh, using this method, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, you can really uh, train the car to, to uh, drive reasonably well in a, in a simulator. So it sounds simple enough. Uh, so, so now let's... Uh, uh, recent uh, research has shown that these uh, neural networks are, can be easily fooled. So let's say you have a classifier uh, which needs to predict uh, 1,000 classes which means that you want to predict if, if something is an animal, a car, a type of uh, animal, for example, uh, a toy or, or something uh, like that. And then you would expect that if you put some kind of a random image, for example, like uh, the noise above or something like these funny structures, uh, that the network will be unsure in its predictions. Uh, but uh, they, they have actually uh, created uh, these examples specifically using evolutionary algorithms uh, and the networks uh, achieved, uh, were confident above 99.6% that this belongs to some class. For example, king penguin down left, uh, starfish, baseball, which actually makes some sense. and. The noise doesn't make any sense, but the network is very uh, confident that it's saw something that isn't there. Uh, the, more, the more interesting example uh, of this is that we uh, try to uh, change an input image in uh, indistinguishable way to human eye, and then uh, this produces uh, the the image uh, which will be totally misclassified by a trained neural network which achieves high accuracies on the normal uh, data. So uh, we've actually created a demo, uh, not, not trained on tra traffic signs, but uh, on uh, human faces. The data set used was uh, Faces in the Wild, which is a publicly available uh, data set of uh, human faces, and the model achieves more than 95% of the accuracy. Actually, on, on good images, this percentage would be uh, much higher. And also, there, there was, uh, you, you could train that to go up, but I believe that you, you can agree that 95% is a good accuracy. Now, uh, these four images that you can see uh, uh, below, uh, are the images that were not part of the Faces in the Wild dataset. And we want to create uh, images which would be indistinguishable from these images, and the network would classify them completely uh, wrongly. So uh, how do you do this? Uh, you take your original model, and then you try to create an uh, another model, which takes an image as an input and outputs another image. So uh, this, this other image has a constraint. And when you train neural networks, you, you, uh, this constraint means, means that you punish the network uh, if it uh, stirs away from this, uh, from this constraint and you, uh, and you uh, reward the network if uh, these constraints are satisfied. So the constraint was that the image is close as possible to the original image and that uh, the original classifier makes the mistake as, as large as possible. So these are, these are the constraints. Uh, just to explain what does it mean to, to, to have, a, how do we measure is the image uh, uh, visually close? You you look at the pixel values. For example, you, you know that images are, are encoded as an array of uh, 0 to 125 uh, 
and we, we try to reduce the mean squared error between the original image and the refined image as much as possible. So uh, let's, uh, let's go into demo. Okay, so some Python code, don't, don't, don't get scared. We'll load the networks, both the refined network and, and uh, the original network. Now, we'll try to classify the images you've seen in the previous slide and uh, see what does our network tell us. So, we have... Uh, uh, so, j just explain uh, for for classifier uh, for binary classifier. Uh, if uh, some class is above fifty percent, then we designate it as that class. So, you you, you can uh, look at these numbers as probabilities, although I would not recommend so. Um, so, the first image was uh, well classified, so it's a female. The second image is a male. The third image was classified as female, and the fourth image was classified as, as male. Now let's, let's try to create an adversarial example. So the adversarial example should uh, get misclassified by this network. So these adversarial uh, examples were created from uh, one network and then are put as an input to another network. So let's see the, the results now. So these are the refined images. So these are the refined images. And look at the predictions. Now, the Lydia, Lydia is 98% male. This gentleman here is 98% female. This lady here is, again, about 98%. About and this gentleman here is also misclassified. Uh, let's look at the, at the original images one more time. So you, you can see that, obviously, there's insignificant difference between these images. And we can actually calculate for the last image. I don't know if uh, the projector can allow us to see these changes. Um, so you see some almost random noise, uh, and this is the difference. This is the difference, so it's, it's minimal. Oh, I almost forgot. Now, you might think that these images are, uh, that these networks are uh, very sensitive to, uh, to these uh, modifications. Uh, to, to these modifications, obviously they are, but to random modifications or to modifications in general. Uh, just, just to tell you something about the training process. When you train the neural network, you usually want to enlarge your data set by doing some transformations which will simulate uh, the, the stuff that really happens in, uh, in reality. For example, uh, if you take this image uh, and then you uh, add some brightness or reduce some brightness, you can imagine that uh, this image would be uh, taken under, under dif different lighting, uh, lighting conditions and uh, both of these images would be recognizable, uh, recognizable to us and we would uh, classify it correctly. So the, the algorithm needs to be uh, aware of these small changes. But uh, here I, I'm, I'm going to, to destroy the image by adding a, a large uh, vertical stripe or horizontal stripe across the image and, and then put it to original network and try to get, uh, try to see what the classification is. So, here's what we've done. So this is now input to our original network. Lydia is still classified as female. This gentleman is still classified as male. This lady, female and male. So this, this, this huge transformation has not made uh, any uh, ha has reduced uh, the confidences and probably would reduce uh, the accuracy of a model, but model is fairly robust to even such a uh, huge uh, change. So let's try. Um, I can't type with one hand. Okay, let, let's try this one. Okay. Again, as, uh, as you can see, uh, everything is as we would expect. Uh, the third image 
was almost classified as male, but our network defeated it. So uh, let's continue with the presentation. Okay, uh, how is this possible? Well, uh, let's, let's take uh, uh, two-dimensional two data. And let's say that you have two classes. One are X's and the other ones are circles. So uh, the, the dashed line is the real line that's separating the classes. The full line is uh, our model decision boundary, which, which was created during the training process. As you can see, that some, uh, s some of the... Uh, data points are close to decision boundary and you you need to you, you can imagine that these are images but just two-dimensional data now you, you can uh, expect to make some uh, small uh, perturbation or small nudge in a in a uh, uh, in in a direction of changing the class uh, and and this this would be this would still be uh, a point with close coordinates, so close image visually, but uh, the class would be different. And now you might ask, okay, but you have these images that are far away from the, from the decision boundary, but you can imagine that this is just a 2D, uh, this is just a 2D uh, and uh, uh, images are usually uh, 256 times 256 uh, times three channels, which is about 200,000, and this is a standard input to a, a convolutional neural network. Uh, so in, in 200,000 dimensional space, there are a lot of directions where you can push your point, uh, your data point, and cross the decision boundary, and this is how it gets uh, misclassified. So uh, one might think, okay, these are artificial examples. Can we do modifications in physical world and still get this, uh, still get this problem? So uh, the recent uh, research uh, was published, and uh, what they did is found w which areas of the image uh, could be altered by uh, by putting some stickers or something, some small modifications, which would resemble something that you can find in reality. Uh, and if this could uh, confuse the network to misclassify. And they actually found that uh, these examples are fairly robust to, to, to for example, uh, rotations of this sign. Uh, and these are real images. And the stop sign is misclassified as speed limit 45, which you don't want. So getting back to a self-driving car example, so, you know, how, how do we defend against these attacks? So, there's no universal uh, defense, uh, but here, here are some examples. For example, we can enrich our train data uh, with, uh, with adversarial examples, and then our models will become more robust to these uh, examples. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this has some drawbacks, and this is that uh, although, you, uh, although your network is now more robust to, to specific methods, uh, the, uh, you still get the, you can still train the adversarial network to it will just take longer, or you can take a totally different approach in training these uh, adversarial examples, and then you would fool the network anyway. Uh, you're still operating in very high dimensional uh, space where there are a lot of ways in which you can jitter the data and still get uh, the adversarial examples. Uh, one, one other way is to hide the gradients. What does this mean? Well, our networks, as you've, as you've seen, uh, output uh, probabilities. So, confidences, confidences. They, they, they output confidences. And if uh, you change the image a bit, for example, you change one uh, pixel, then you will, you will see that the confidence also changes. It will not change uh, in any significant way for some random, uh, uh, random change. Uh, but if you, uh, if you use this information how the change occurred, 
then you can, uh, you can take the gradient, you can take the direction of biggest change in negative, di in negative direction, which will reduce the, the, the confidence as much as possible. Do this enough times and you will get uh, the, you will get the adversarial examples. So, uh, why not only return the classes? Why not our, our previously trained model? Why not say this is a stop sign, this is a, a woman, this is a man? So we could, we could do that. Uh, and then we, we wouldn't have a gradient which we could, uh, which, which, which you, we could use. So the neural networks are trained in a way that you uh, take many little steps in the direction which maximizes or minimizes your loss, minimizes your loss function. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can still fool these networks. So this is not enough. Uh, because it, it has been shown that uh, that adversarial examples are uh, uh, can be transferred across uh, different architectures. So the, these uh, these uh, examples can be used on other networks, and they, they would still be fooled. Uh, not always. Not uh, perhaps as perfect as in example which you were uh, attacking against, but you can do it. And uh, uh, so, so you can train a subs substitute uh, network to do some job, and then you can train an adversarial network for a, this substitute network where you have uh, uh, have the gradients, and then you can use these adversarial examples on your uh, on network you want to to attack. So, uh, defensive distillation. So, this is another technique. Uh, you can train another uh, classifier. Uh, for, uh, not, uh, uh, you have your original model. Then you can train another model which, which doesn't predict the classes, but which predicts the probabilities of your network which is trained on some task. Uh, this results in a smoother decision boundary. Which, uh, but what, what this means is that uh, the gradients will have smaller, uh, the, the changes in the input data will, will uh, make smaller changes to the, the output of the, of the network. So uh, the gradients are smaller and uh, then it's, uh, you need much more time to train under, an adversarial model to, to use these gradients. Okay. Uh, but there are also drawbacks. You can reduce the accuracy of the original model. That's one. And the, the other one is that attacker, again, can just use more resources. Uh, and there's also something that's, that's not here, and that's that uh, we've recently started using optimization methods which, which are highly adaptive. So if they uh, come to an uh, optimization landscape which is uh, fairly flat, then the learning rate of an algorithm is, is uh, boosted by a number or, or two, two number of orders of magnitudes. And, and so this landscape is, uh, can be, uh, uh, you, you can go away from this landscape in, in a small number of steps. So you can still train the, the network. Uh, okay, so some few uh, examples. I don't have much time. So uh, you can create adversarial networks for, for example, avoiding spam filters, for uh, making illegal content legal, for uh, design a uh, web page which will artificially increase the ranking, uh, fooling out education systems, and so on. So back to Marco. Yeah. So ju ju just to recap what we just said, uh, so we gave a brief overview of how these models evolved at all. Uh, we described how they depend heavily on the training set distribution, uh, which then translate to all of the, all these problems that we heard later. Uh, we take, took a look uh, at uh, self-driving cars as an attractive example of this. Uh, and we show some practical examples of adversarial attacks for uh, phase detection uh, 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 gender uh, gender recognition, actually. Uh, then, just briefly, we talked about uh, defense strategies, uh, how to defend yourself against uh, these attacks. Uh, so, hopefully, this was an interesting lecture uh, for you, and hopefully, we uh, 
uh, put some uh, uh, top, uh, uh, some stress on importance of uh, this topic because these models are uh, becoming more and more uh, popular and people tend to use them, just uh, take them for granted and just plug, it in, plug them in to their data set and their use case. Uh, but it's not ju such uh, uh, just as simple as that. Uh, it should be done with, with more cautious. Um, so uh, these are some of our team members. This is not photoshopped. Uh, you can find us here in the conference and ask some questions. And of course, if we have uh, some time, uh, I think we have for a few questions now, we will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no questions. Okay. The next topic is Malio teaching a machine to detect malware. The presenter is Tony Grzinic. About Malio. Malio is a machine learning framework that successfully detects yep. new malware samples. Despite the fact that malware is constantly changing and non-stationary malware distribution presents a challenge for statistical methods due to the phenomena of concept drift, Malio helps to overcome these problems and, help, and can help to better detect new malware samples at large scale. About Tony, Tony is helping organizations to become more secure working as an information security consultant in Diverto. Besides that, he manages to write his he managed to write his doctor thesis. Also, Tony will, will performing music at the after party. <laughs> so the talk will be short. <laughs> I will not take any questions because we have to prepare the after party. So I'm Tony and I will be talking about Malio. Malio is a machine learning framework to detect malware. It basically de detects only portable executable malware. Uh, this is my agenda. This morning, morning I didn't have any slide. I built all slides when I was listening to the politicians. So the, tech, uh, the talk is not prepared, so stand up and enjoy. <laughs> uh, back to 2014, I was trying to write my PhD thesis and find a, find a topic. Basically, I was trying to detect anomalies in time series. Uh, I was analyzing logs and I have a big problem. Uh, RDD, no, car, I was work, working at Carnet and basically um, I had a lot of data. It was cool and I was doing math, which I love, but I have one big problem. The biggest curse of big data is when you don't have enough data. Uh, the Carnet NOC, the Network Operations Center, was on summer holidays. I didn't have any data. The annotation of the data set was painful. I was waiting uh, for the attackers to attack our network, to annotate the, site, the data, data set, and to learn my models. So I have so much problems. <laughs> so. I was talking to Tonimir. Tonimir is my mentor on the PhD th thesis. And he said to me, I don't know, it's your problem. Be creative. So I changed the idea. At that time, Game Over Zeus uh, button was disrupted. So I said, OK, that's a bit, big thing. Let's see what we can do here. I, I was listening to the end game talk about binary pick. Binary pick is a Hadoop framework to extract uh, data from 
from portable, portable executable files. And I said, hmm, that sounds so interesting. And it's better than the normally detection thing because it doesn't have so much math, it's e easier, and it's more sellable. So what problem I'm trying to solve here? So the problem with antivirus uh, is the number of signatures. The antivirus companies cannot stand the competition with the, with the Marvel mother authors because they're so creative. It's basically a catch-up game. So every year, the number of signatures goes up. It it's go, goes up exponentially. This is basically a picture for the Romanian cert uh, about the evolution of ransomware. Ransomware. So you can see it's so much samples, new things, and stuff. But who is Malio? Who is Malio is basically, Malio is my grandpa. What is Malio? Malio is a framework. I said that earlier. Uh, uses a bunch of classifiers uh, to detect malware. So it uses the static analysis classifier, thanks to Ero Carrera and his amazing work, and the dynamic analysis, which is based on Cook Sandbox. So I take different classifiers and I fusion, uh, I fusion it together. So uh, basically every type of analysis has some type of problem. Static analysis is bad, is bad for packed files and dynamic analysis is bad for anti-debug and anti-VM methods. So when I, fusion, when I try to combine them together, I get a better result. Basically, the data problem was solved pretty easy, thanks to the guy from, from Twitter. Malakal is great. It has many samples, and VirusShare is also pretty great. It, it has, I don't know, 100 terabytes of malware samples. Basically, this is <laughs> my workflow of my framework. Basically, it used Cuckoo. It launched the malware file in the virtual machines. It stored the, uh, the analysis result in MongoDB. The batch script, it's a simple uh, batch script which runs all the analysis. And Franco, which is written in Python, does all the crunching. Basically, this is the storage one function, and this is the analysis one. It creates the matrices with the features. Then we learn the model, and when we have the models, we can classify the malware. It's simple. So I'm basically using only open source. I'm standing on the shoulder, shoulders of giants. Basically the classic scientific Python stack. I'm using NumPy, IPython, Pandas, scikit-learn, uh, I'm running the analysis thing in KVM, I mentioned Cuckoo late, earlier, and basically I use Mongo and Postgre for storage. At the moment, I have three classifiers. Uh, the first one use only static features, the second one is dynamic, which use some system calls properties, like arguments properties, and the second one is basically a system call graph, which is basically a matrix of all system calls. Basically, the idea is based on one idea with one great scientist. It's called Wol Wolpert. Anybody, anybody heard from about Wolpert? Uh, he wrote about the no free lunch theorem. So he also wrote about the stack generalization. And basically, Marco talked about convolutional networks deep learning. This is an old school technique from, from 1992. It basically uses multiple classifiers. It takes their predictions, uses a meta classifier, and gives us the final prediction. 
So the training data. The training data was derived from a big data set of 50,000 50, samples. It was stratified by year and by malware type. The malware type was derived by the antivirus Kaspersky, thanks to Kaspersky. It helped me a lot. So let's benchmark Malio to others. Uh, this is my PhD topic, and I can show all the results. Basically, one guy who was working at the Los Alamos laboratory, now he's in Cisco, was the best. It was my idol. And I had so much problem with that paper, and it wasted me a lot of time. So finally, he was the best one, uh, but I managed with some transformation of data. It's not about the result. Machine learning uh, in the scientific community, it's all about the results. If you want to have uh, a good classifier, you have to have 99%. Basically, I think it's better to, to, to do a good idea that can classify malware and it's creative than to have a 99% result. Uh, because you have to have a, resi a resilient classifier at the, at the end. So some of the problems of this domain are the following. VM evasion in dynamic analysis. This was a big problem. I patched the Cuckoo monitor function. Anyone uh, look at the source of the Cuckoo monitor function? Guys from reversing labs. I patched it a lot and I have so many problems uh, with that. Uh, I, basically, the Cuckoo monitor it's not that, that, that bad, but malware authors are so creative in escaping sandboxing environment. So they, they are finding every day new ways to escape sandboxing. Also, this model has to have a human in the loop. Uh, guys from Google, Scully uh, wrote about, Scully and colleagues wrote about uh, detection of spam advertisements. And they said they, without a human, without an analyst in the loop, you cannot detect basically the ads which are uh, malicious. Also, the temporal component. I had so many problems while, uh, while finding uh, some new ransomers, putting it in the data set. And with the, res the results were so bad. Basically, new malware drifts your distribution of, of data and skews your results. So this is a big problem also. One idea, what I plan to do next is to build a phylogenetics tree of malware. Basically, you have one branch like you saw on the Third Romanian third picture, you have one uh, one tree with all malware samples and ancestors and stuff like that. So, future of Malio. I plan to support more formats for it, uh, use this assembly and build another classifier which uses this assembly, provision it to the cloud and uh, change Postgre with some other technologies like ClickHouse, it's a Yandex database, column oriented, I think. Spark, Dusk, basically I'm benchmarking this together to see which suits more for my usage. This is my talk, so fast questions if somebody wants to ask me on, or you can ask me any questions on my email. Anyone? Yeah, you can basically, the fr this is why I call it framework. You can extend the framework with any uh, classifier you want. You build a, build a symbolic execution classifier and then you incorporate in the framework. The only problem is you cannot have many classifiers. When you go to five classifiers, there's a problem because you have to problem to manage all that. That's the only problem. 
but it's one idea, not the symbolic execution one, but the dynamic instrumentation with pin and stuff like that. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Thank you.